Good morning, it's time to look back at the results of the first semi-final of the Eurovision Song Contest 2019. I will do that, uh, which we will do uh, the entire week with. Stefan Gorkum, Chief Editor of ESC Daily. Uh, do you want to start with the positive surprises or the, in my opinion, negative surprises? Well, I mean, the biggest surprise for me was a negative surprise, in my opinion, which was the fact that Hungary didn't qualify. It was the story of this semi-final. Okay, we'll start about that. What was, that? that's of course the thing we're going to look at, what was wrong with it? Why didn't it make it? I mean, if you compare Hungary with Hungary in 2017, of course, when Yoti Papai also took part, I think that song was much more televote friendly. It stood out a lot more. And that's the kind of thing that has bugged me throughout the week, Somewhere in the back of my head, I mean, I never would have guessed that it wouldn't qualify because in this semi-final I still thought his vocal performance was strong enough uh, to make it through. We predicted him top five in the jury in our uh, jury show, which theoretically is still possible. It happened before that songs like uh, like Netherlands in 2015 or Latvia last year finished top five in the juries and still don't make it. I think the televote may have been his biggest problem in the end. Is it the, the, the biggest shock of the night, the biggest shock non-qualifier, or were there others um, that, that really surprised you that they didn't make it? Actually, no. Um, I didn't have a long list of songs that really had to make it through in the semi-final. Um, I, I struggled c coming to 10 qualifiers at all. Um, so for me, Hungary is the biggest uh, shock non-qualifier. Uh, and then there's a couple in there that you think that you could argue might have taken uh, Hungary's place. I know for some also Portugal not qualifying was a big surprise. Not so much for me, but um, I think if you look at the full results and if you then add Portugal to Hungary and to all the other stuff that didn't qualify, um, you may conclude that the ethnic stuff just didn't do it last night. Some uh, surprise qualifiers uh, in there with um, San Marino, of course, the second qualification uh, ever from the final spot. You predicted it. You predicted Serhat to make the final. Explain. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I was actually quite keen on his qualification chances from early on in the season because when I showed that song to other people like outside of the Eurovision bubble, I always got positive feedback. And not even positive in the sense that, you know, it was funny because it's so bad. No, they actually liked that song. And then I started looking into the voting figures from 2016. I saw that he was 11 in the televote there with a much worse song, a song that wasn't a disco song at first and then transferred into a disco song in a really strange way. This is the stuff that he, I think, needs to do at Eurovision. It's a better song, and I thought it could get a good televote. Did the juries forget to do their job? Because when we look at vocals of Serhat, we just listen back to the performance. Same goes for Estonia. It's almost impossible that they were not in the bottom three of the jury, one would say. We're going to have to wait for the split results to see if the juries did a good job. We predicted both Slovenia, uh, sorry, both San Marino and Estonia in the bottom four at the at the jury show in our uh, in our analysis. That's still very well possible because there might be, if you look at the results from last night, there might be a very big discrepancy between uh, jury vote and televote again. San Marino is the best example. I'm quite sure that Serhat qualified mainly on televote. He had his running order going for him as well. On a positive scale then, uh, Australia, Greece, we had some debate about them this week, who would win the semi-final. We've now seen the actual show, seen how it landed with, with people outside of the bubble. Your thoughts now, who might have won this semi-final? It's much more looking like Australia won the semi-final for me now. Because the vibe outside Eurovision bubble is is really picking up on that. I even caught wind of... We, we, we were in the press center last night with some really... Uh, some statistics people, let's say. Uh, the guy from Telestats, and they told us that even Australia at some point was more of a hype online than Iceland, for example, which we expected would, would, would get picked up, would be a story. So... Australia is really the talk of the town. They have a great staging, impressive staging, and um, they, I, I think they are the one that did best with both juries and televotes, could be top five in both. A draw in the second half of the final on Saturday for them. Uh, they are in the bookmakers list, the only contender for a real high place, it seems, now in that final. Do you agree on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't see... 
looking back at the performance from Greece, I think it's really only for juries. The more I look at it, the less I see the televote appeal in that one. Then there's Cyprus, who's not really doing as well as the fans may have predicted, predicted before the contest. So, uh, yeah, looking at that, I mean, there is still Iceland, and even though the hype was not as big as we may have expected, that still could yeah. grow. Uh, but other than that, no, I think those are the only two that can actually get anywhere near a high position in the final. And of course, the fact that Australia is now a big hype is for us as ESC Daily is a, is a really interesting thing, and it's something that we're going to follow. One uh, more or less thing to make up the, the, the numbers if we have them. Some uh, It's a different final field than in years before. I always liked that. Uh, Hungary for the first time in many, many years, not in the final. Uh, and a couple of nations who um, who haven't been there in recent years, like Iceland, are, are back now. And, and, and Belarus, uh, of course, who didn't make it recently. Uh, what does that say to you? Well, first of all, it proves that Eurovision is uh, unpredictable, is um, is most of all really about the song and about the entries. And countries really do have to bring their best every year. And again, there are no guarantees in terms of flags of who will qualify. Even a country like Greece, who we, uh, like five years ago, people would have said they are always going to be in the final. Then they had a very poor run of three years. They changed their strategy. That's the important part. They changed their strategy to go from more ethnic stuff to mainstream stuff. And now they qualified again. And I think they have the time going for them as well. Because if you look at the results, if you look at the ones that we just discussed, Estonia, San Marino, all those surprise qualifiers, it's the more Western, the more mainstream stuff that won and the more ethnic stuff that got eliminated. Cool. So far in the first semi-final, we will um, um, look at the second semi-final, of course. This afternoon, the first dress rehearsal, I will be blogging everything about the show. What will the presenters do? How do the postcards look? Stuff like that. You can follow it in the afternoon and in the evening. Uh, Steve is back. Uh, I, will, I will help him a bit. <laughs> but it's his uh, expertise about the vocal assessments. It's, uh, it's always a fun day. Always a fun, fun day, the dress rehearsal day. Yeah, I love it. I love doing that dress, that jury rehearsal, and I hope that everybody's going to tune in and see, uh, let us be your ears and eyes because you cannot see the jury show for yourself, but you want to know because it's 50% of the results. So uh, we're going to do the best to describe uh, uh, everything for you as best as possible. Thanks for listening, and we will also look back in our podcast on uh, everything that uh, will happen today, tomorrow. <laughs>